Hi guys, we've talked a lot about decluttering on this channel, so it's about time that we talked about visual clutter. With visual clutter, you might not even have that much clutter in your home, but your home still looks and feels full. And this is because of what's in your line of sight. Having visual clutter can make it hard to fully relax or focus or feel optimal in our homes, but there are great solutions to remedy visual clutter. And there are also specific places to look to find out where visual clutter is in your space. So in this video, we'll talk about 21 ways to reduce visual clutter. And by the way, my name is Mika and I'm a writer and I also own a small professional home organizing business. I've helped hundreds of people declutter and organize their homes and it's a passion of mine to help people make their homes feel great. I'm writing a book series about how to have good vibes in your home and I'm currently working on the decluttering book. As I write, I share some of what I've written for the week on this channel, and this week I wrote about how to reduce visual clutter. So getting right into it. Number one is have homes for your items. With daily life, there's movement and things go in and out. Our spaces can quickly become visually cluttered, so it's important to have homes for things and basic systems in place. This is slightly different for every home and is dependent on lifestyle and activities that take place in the home. But a few things that I think benefits each home is to have a key hook or key dish so you always know where your keys are, and then the same place to put down your mail so that you can go through it rather quickly, and an area for organized shoes. So have a home for each of your items and get into the habit of putting things back into their homes once you're done using them. If you're not currently in the habit of putting things back once you're done using them, you'll see a big difference in visual clutter. It might take a little bit of time to form the habit, but once you get used to it, it becomes so easy to do because it's your default reaction. And to put things back, for most things, takes very little effort. For example, instead of tossing a piece of clothing on a chair, it might maybe take an extra 20 seconds to hang it up. And if you use pens that are in a mug, for example, it takes like two extra seconds to put the pen back into the mug when you're finished, as opposed to just setting the pen right next to the mug. When you create this habit, you'll feel better and your home will feel better. And you've probably heard the quote, the way we do small things determines the way we do everything by Robin Sharma. So this might sound strange and unrelated, but I think that if you form this habit, you'll also end up procrastinating less because you have follow through in your actions. Lastly, with this point, it's best to communicate with everyone else who lives in your home to also put items back into their homes after they finish using them. Number two is declutter. So this one is fairly obvious, but when you have too much stuff for your space, your stuff will build up and can become an eyesore. This can be not just a nuisance, but it can be a big stress inducer. Again, because we do bring things in and out, it's good to keep an eye on things that no longer serve you, things that you don't need, use, or love, and let go of them when you spot them. It's really helpful to keep a donation slash sell box somewhere so that as soon as you spot something that you want to donate or sell, it has a home and can go into that box. And also to maintain a clutter-free environment that supports and nurtures you, it really helps to bring in new things with intention and moderation. Number three is to make sure that you have enough storage. So with this one, you just have to be careful that you're not creating storage for your clutter. So you want to make sure to declutter first before implementing or restructuring or buying new storage systems. Storage systems and furniture and organizing supplies can be very functional and helpful, but they can also add up and be expensive. So you don't want to buy unnecessary storage supplies for your clutter. There have been so many times where I've helped clients declutter and organize, and once they get their possessions down to what they want, need, use, and love, their homes feel way better, and they have way more functional storage space. And there have been countless times, though, that they're left with all these extra storage supplies that they've bought, like bins and extra storage furniture and organizers and dividers. Sometimes hundreds and even thousands of dollars worth of organizing supplies. But you do want adequate storage for your stuff. So if you need to get creative and create storage space for your stuff, this can be really fun, but also just keep in mind that tidbit so that you're not spending time, money, and energy to house your clutter. Sometimes we 
might need to adjust our storage space. So it's a, a good way to do this is to declutter first, then notice where excess clutter seems to collect and create a storage solution for it. Which leads me to my next point. Number four is store stuff behind closed doors or have hidden storage. It can help so much with visual clutter to store things neatly behind closed doors or where you can't see them. And I'm going to give you the epitome of an example of this. But first to preface, a little side note is that I am American and Japanese and I'm a dual national and I've grown up between both countries and speak and think and dream in both languages. I'm quite literally a fusion of East and West, exactly half and half. And sometimes East and West can have different principles. And through my life, I've peacefully combined and enmeshed the two to my understanding. So if you watch this channel, at times you might see a bit of an underlying Japanese philosophical influence, and that's why. So anyways, for part of my childhood, I grew up in my Japanese grandparents' home in Japan in what you would consider to be a traditionally minimalist Japanese home. I want to show you guys pictures, but I want to be respectful of my family because we still have that house. So I'm just going to overlay the general aesthetic of what it looked like, but it's not the actual house. The home had tatami floors and sand finish walls and very little furniture or possessions that were in view or in the line of sight. In fact, if you peeked your head in there, you might be like, where's the furniture and where's your stuff? <laughs> Even our beds were traditional futons. So you take them out at night, lay them out, go to sleep, and then in the morning you fold them up and put them away. And this may sound restrictive, but it was totally not, not at all. And there was so much freedom there and so much room and so many good memories. And it was a really pretty house. There were four of us who lived there and we all still had possessions. In fact, I think I had quite a few toys. But the trick to that home was there was adequate and ample storage that didn't draw attention. So the entire upstairs of that home consisted of two big adjoining rooms that were separated by rice paper doors. And in both rooms, an entire wall on one side of each room had a storage closet that was covered, almost camouflaged in a sense, with these beautiful sliding doors. So in this home, there was almost no visual clutter because we had good storage and it was behind closed doors. And the other thing was it wasn't boring to the eye at all because of all the natural texture. So optionally, you can think about storing your things behind closed doors for less visual clutter and maybe even kind of camouflaging your storage to where it doesn't even look conspicuously like storage. I have a lot more to say about this. So at some point I'll want to, and I will make a video dedicated entirely to living space and storage space and talk more about this. Number five is be intentional with what is on your horizontal surfaces. Ooh, this can make a big difference in a home. Horizontal surfaces tend to accumulate things and this can be an easy win for tackling visual clutter. So you can take a look at each horizontal surface in your space and see what is contributing to that space and what you want there. For example, if it's a great place for a clock or a lamp or a candle or a small stack of books, keep it there. But if there's anything that doesn't quite make sense or isn't a big contributor to functionality or isn't visually pleasing, take those things off and store them elsewhere. If you clear those excess items off of your surfaces and just keep the things that contribute to the feeling and function of your space on your horizontal surfaces and aim to keep it that way, it can make a huge difference in the feeling of your room. This goes hand in hand with point number one, because if you have a home for your items and systems in place, keeping surfaces clear becomes an easy thing to do. Then when you have things that you want to do, like say a puzzle or writing some notes down or eating, you don't have to clear the space in order to do your activity. This makes daily activities easier in so many ways because we often have random differing things to do and many times we need to set things down and have the space to work and focus. This doesn't mean that the horizontal space has to 100% no matter what always be clear. Like sometimes 
you might have something like a puzzle. You take a few days to work on it, then you finish it, and then you admire it for a few days, and then you remove it. Then that horizontal space is clear again. This is more overall the intent to keep the horizontal surfaces clear. So things might get set down, yes, but the majority of the time it's clear and ready for your next activity. Number six is be conscious of having enough negative space on your walls. So you probably know what negative space is, but just in case it's your first time hearing the term, negative space is empty space, or it's the empty space that's around something or in between something. For example, if you hang a picture on the wall, you want to have space on all sides of the picture to be able to really take in and appreciate that picture. If it's crammed with other pictures on all sides without enough negative space, it can lead to looking visually cluttered. For example, if we take the Mona Lisa, which is at the Louvre, it's not surrounded on all sides with other portraits and paintings because that negative space that's around the Mona Lisa helps to give it room to breathe and be seen and also allows for the painting to have more visual impact. So we use negative space to balance out positive space. And when you have negative space around something, it adds to the artistic composition and the ability to be able to appreciate the subject on display. And it's funny because negative space sounds negative when you first hear it, but it's imperative to good design and artistic composition. And you also need to have enough negative space in a room so that it feels visually calm and comfortable. And it also gives a place for your eyes to rest. If there's not very many places for your eyes to be able to rest in a room, it makes the eyes weary and the mind unable to rest. And I think it also congests the feeling and energy of a room. There's a Japanese concept for negative space and it's called ma, and it basically means negative space. And it's also the space that's necessary to be able to breathe or grow. Ma is a concept dedicated to the beauty and appreciation of the space that's in between things. So getting back to the negative space on your walls, this can mean spacing out art and shelves on the wall until it's comfortable to the eyes and making sure that there's enough negative space in a room so that your items on display can be appreciated and your eyes also have plenty of space to rest within the room. If you have stuff everywhere with minimal space between things, it can create a chaotic feeling. So negative space is very important. And as we consciously think about how important negative space is, we end up having appreciation for negative space that can make a big difference in the feeling of a room. Number seven is remove things off of floors that aren't meant to be there. This again has to do with negative space and eliminating visual clutter. And I also tend to look at homes through an energetic aspect. I've studied feng shui for about 15 years, and so I am very influenced by the feel of a space and the flow or, or the energy flow of a room. And I think that stuff that's on the floor that isn't meant to be there has this heavier energy. Like if you have clutter on the floor versus clutter on a piece of furniture, I think that the clutter on the floor weighs down the space more. So. Anyways, if you remove things off of the floor that aren't meant to be there, I think that you will feel a shift of energy in your space. And also, this is a great way to reduce visual clutter. Number eight, you can optionally replace smaller decor with statement pieces, or you can group items together so that they become a statement piece. I hesitate to say this one because sometimes this doesn't apply and displaying smaller things can also look great. But there are times that instead of having many small things spread out, sometimes it can be soothing to the eye to have one or a few statement pieces instead. Number nine is put things away that don't need to be out. Reassess items that have a home in plain view. Clothes maybe that are on hooks that can be put back into the closet. Extra cords and chargers that aren't in use. Extra post-it pads that you usually store on your desk. If you can store them away and it's still functional for you, then it might be a good idea to do so. Number 10 is use your items as functional decor. 
So I'm curious to hear what you think, but for the longest time, I always thought of home decor as things that are in the home decor aisle at the store or things that you intentionally buy to decorate your home with. And I think it was literally only about a decade ago that I realized that decor is really kind of, it's anything that's in your line of sight. So that air purifier, it ends up being part of your decor. Your mug with pens in it on your desk, it ends up being part of your decor. The stack of books on your side table ends up being decor and so on. And kind of the beauty of this is that you can use things as decor that aren't traditionally necessarily meant to be decor. And now I love doing this with stuff that's easier to have out. And then I like styling it to make it pleasing to the eye. So I consider this functional decor. For example, I have these AirPods that it's just infinitely easier for me to have out. I'm walking every day right now to rehab a knee injury. And for me, it's made my life just so much easier to grab them off of my desk every time that I go for a walk. And when I had initially set them down on my desk, it looked kind of lackluster sitting there. So then I got these little red rain boots and it makes me so happy to look at them now. I think that they're so cute. And the little red rain boots, they're actually a cell phone holder, but it's perfect for my AirPods. And if you have jewelry, instead of putting them out on a table, you can put them in a little pretty trinket dish or holder that makes you happy. Kind of the same thing with keys, right? To have a hook or a dish that you like to look at. You can also use trays and you can style things that aren't necessarily meant to be decor. And it's not only functional, but it's convenient and it helps to keep things together and organized. I think that this reduces visual clutter because it takes a little bit of effort, but it can take things from lackluster and looking like potential visual clutter to lifting your energy and pleasing to the eye. Going back to those AirPods, I don't know why, but those little $12 rain boots make me so happy. When I had the AirPods just out on my desk, I kept moving them around. I put them in my purse and then back on the desk and then on that side table. But as soon as I got this holder, I felt like they have a home and I haven't moved them since, except for to use them and then put them back. Sometimes it's the little details that can make a big difference in your daily experience. Number 11 is make your bed every morning. We've talked about this briefly in another video, but beds take up quite a bit of visual space. If you make your bed, it will have a big impact on the look and the feel of your space. Making your bed in the morning is also supposed to give you a small and immediate win to the start of your day, which can impact the rest of your day's productivity. If you're interested in learning more about this, there's a book, Make Your Bed by Admiral William H. McRaven, and the book speaks to this, and I'll link it in the description below. Now, I also personally think that since we spend a third of our lives in our beds and quality sleep is so important to clear functioning, good health, good flow of energy through our bodies and bodily repairs, anti-aging, anti-stress, that having a comfortable mattress and quality and comfortable breathable bedding is so worth it. I love that casual made but unmade bed feel. And when we just spoke of using items as functional decor, I think that a bed can easily be really nice to look at and a great focal point to a room. And because it takes up so much visual space, it's all the more reason to make it visually pleasing. Number 12 is hide or clean up your cords. This seems so small, but loose cords can really be an eyesore and create visual clutter. It's very inexpensive and takes a little bit of effort to consolidate the cords and tuck them away so that they are no longer conspicuous. And then you don't have to look at them every day and your everyday self will thank you. There are some people who put surge protectors in a drawer, others who screw a surge protector to the underside of their desks and hide the cords alongside the legs of their desks. Others, they hide their cords behind furniture and there are also cord covers that you can buy that attach to the wall so that the cords can be grouped together and hidden inside and then they're just much less conspicuous. This small and easy thing makes a big difference in the feel of a room. Number 13 is put away most appliances when they aren't in use. For example, if you use your toaster or rice cooker, even if you plan to use it again the next day, put it away afterwards. 
and keep only a select few appliances out on your countertops. It only takes a minute to take them out and put them away, but for the rest of the 16 hours or so that you're awake, as many times as you walk into your kitchen, the countertop will feel less cluttered and more peaceful. Number 14 is keep your plants healthy. If there is a yellowing leaf, take it off. And if the plant starts to look wilted, start a recognizance mission to figure out what's wrong with it and fix it. Whether the plant just needs watering or it's the beginning stages of root rot, you generally want to keep an eye on your plants and if something looks off, fix it early. A healthy plant can do so much. It can add color, texture, warmth, and liveliness to a space but an unhealthy plant will make a space look and feel visually cluttered. Number 15 is reduce the visual weight of furniture. This one only applies if you feel that a certain piece of furniture looks heavy and is weighing down the feeling of the room and contributing to visual clutter. Sometimes when something is disproportionately visually heavy, a space can feel cluttered. So if you need and like that piece of furniture and you think that lightening the visual weight will contribute to creating more balance and airiness in the room, there are a couple of simple tricks that you can do to lighten the visual weight. The first trick that you can do is to use leggy furniture or add legs to a piece of furniture to lift it up a bit. Having space under a piece of furniture will automatically make it visually lighter. Also, lighter colors will help reduce visual weight while darker colors will add to the visual weight. So you can consider making that piece of furniture a lighter color just to be aware of those simple visual tricks can help you balance a room. And sometimes when you balance a room, it can help to fix visual clutter. Number 16 is remove extra furniture. Oof, I love this one. There have been so many times that I've decluttered with a client and they no longer need a piece of furniture because they no longer need the additional storage that that piece of furniture had provided. So they let go of it and suddenly they have all this extra space. This is especially great for rooms that have an excess of furniture in them. I think sometimes when we're trying to reduce visual clutter, we look past the furniture, but furniture is quite important and it's not only actually removing extra furniture, but it's also having furniture that's an optimal size and scale for your space. I'm a really big fan of taking care of what you own and keeping things for a long time. I think it's an honor to take care of things that you own, but if something isn't working in your space, I think it's well worth the effort to sell what you have and replace it with something that works well for your space and for the flow of your room so that it's visually pleasing and comfortable and functional. Number 17 is pay attention to your gut. In some instances, what feels visually cluttered to someone else might not feel visually cluttered to you and vice versa. You know, sometimes it's very easy to get other people's opinions and sometimes it's good to do so. But I believe that we should follow our own gut, especially when it comes to our own homes. Just like some people don't mind the noise of traffic and music and voices as they try to relax or focus, and they might even often have the TV on in the background for stimuli and background noise. But others do mind it and they prefer quiet or the sounds of nature at most in order to be able to relax or focus. It's very subjective and it varies by preference. In a similar way, visual noise or the threshold for visual clutter does vary drastically from person to person. And the beautiful thing about humans is that we're all so different. If we were all the same, it would be very boring. And because this point is so important, I'm just going to give you one more example along the same lines. Some people like a lot of color in their homes, while some people prefer lots of textures with neutrals. And there's really no right or wrong. It's what suits the person that lives there and puts that person most at ease. You know, we don't decorate our homes for other people. We do it to feel comfortable and authentic to ourselves. And our homes are like a support system where we can go to feel rejuvenated and recharged to rest or work. But it has to suit the people who are living there. So really tune into your gut of what level of visual clutter is right for you. And I've been in hundreds of homes and imagine there's this spectrum of visual clutter. On one end, there's this very bare and stark and minimal 
and then on the other end of the spectrum, there's high amounts of visual clutter. I've had someone on this end of the spectrum ask me, hey Mika, is there something wrong with me that I like really stark and minimal spaces? And I'm like, no, because you prefer what you prefer. And then also on this end of the spectrum, I've had people ask me, like, is there something off with me or like wrong with me because I really like kind of cluttery spaces? And the answer is no, because we each have our own preference. And it kind of varies. It's just like all over the place. And I really truly think that's kind of the beauty of people and the beauty of different homes. And number 18 is keep your home clean. If there is dust, pet fur, or messes in our line of sight, it's going to automatically look and feel more cluttered. This one is fairly straightforward, but I want to give you a few tips. First, if you declutter your extra possessions, cleaning becomes much easier to do because if you have excess stuff in your way, you have to move each thing and then clean or clean around it, and it's just much more time consuming. Depending on the amount of excess stuff that's in the way, Cleaning can go from a simple task to an arduous task, but it usually falls somewhere in between the two. And second, I think that this is underestimated, but it can be very beneficial to have a manageable amount of cleaning supplies, meaning not too many. So now over the years, I've been in hundreds of homes and there's this funny irony that I found. This isn't always the case, but I would say that the majority of the time, the homes that have a lot of excess cleaning supplies usually either hire out or don't clean that much themselves. And the homes that have kind of minimal cleaning supplies seem to do a great job of consistently keeping their homes clean. And I think that cleaning supplies can be pretty fun to buy and they can be easily accumulated, but I think that having too many ha causes friction to the action of cleaning. So instead of grabbing your go-to multi-purpose cleaner, you kind of now have to decide which cleaning product to use. And it becomes a little less simple and even just the smallest extra amount of friction and decision making can cause us not to do things as often. Also, cleaning supplies do lose potency and effectiveness over time. For example, bleach has a shelf life of about a year or a year and a half, and then Pine Soul's shelf life is about two years, and multi-purpose cleaning sprays are the most effective during the first two years, and cleaning supplies are chemical mixtures, so they eventually break down over time, and you want to store them in a cool, dark place, and only stock more or less of what you'll actually be able to use. Right now on this channel, I'm writing the decluttering book, so the videos are focused heavily on clutter and decluttering, but the next book that I'll write in this book series will be cleaning and cleaning hacks. So eventually I'll start making some videos that talk more about this. Anyways, on to the next tip that will help you keep your space clean. Number 19 is take 10 minutes every evening or night to tidy up. Taking this 10 minutes helps to keep your space a bit cleaner and tidier, therefore reducing visual clutter. It's best if you try to do this around the same time every day because then eventually it just becomes an automatic habit. So 10 minutes isn't much, but the cumulative effort compounds and makes a difference. And it certainly doesn't make anything worse. And it's amazing how much you can get done in 10 minutes of focus time tidying up. I've incorporated this now and it's been helpful, especially because I live in such a small space, so visual clutter can take over very quickly if I'm not on top of it. I've also had clients in bigger homes incorporate this and I hear really good feedback, especially when they are our families and each family member contributes to cleaning for the 10 minutes together. But you know, when I first incorporated this, I had some resistance, so I'm going to pass on to you what I had to tell myself when I first started doing this. There are 24 hours in a day. For about eight of those hours, give or take, we sleep. Then we have 16 hours left in the day. That's 960 waking minutes in the day. So to take 10 minutes to tidy up at night seems pretty fair because that's about 1% of our waking hours. 1.04% to be exact if we're on an eight hour sleeping schedule. And it makes the day better for ourselves the next day. I sometimes try to think, what can I do today that my future self tomorrow will appreciate? And then I do it without much more thought and I think that this has helped me a lot. Number 20 is take a picture. 
If you feel that you want to reduce visual clutter in a room, but you can't pinpoint where, here's a trick. To identify where visual clutter is, sometimes it helps to take a picture of a room. When we're in the room, we're looking at it in 3D, and we're also accustomed to seeing where things are in the room. If you take a picture, you're now looking at it in 2D form, and it's a different perspective for your brain. You're no longer immersed in that room, but you're taking a step back and you're looking at it from a different angle, and it can suddenly bring more clarity. Just a note of caution though, is after you look at that picture several times, your brain will then get used to seeing that picture, and so don't dwaddle on it, and study it while it's still a fresh perspective. Number 21 is rethink the things in your space that bring down your energy. There's a great quote, have nothing in your house that you do not know to be useful or believe to be beautiful by William Morris. So there are things that will bring up your energy, things that are fairly neutral, and things that will bring down your energy. That quote, have nothing in your house that you do not know to be useful or believe to be beautiful, in one sentence he sums up a great rule of thumb. I think that if something's useful, then it's not going to drag our energy down, although there are some exceptions, like maybe we might need to move something useful to another place for better visual flow in the room. But overall, take a look around you and the things that are in your line of sight. The things that you see should not bring down your energy, especially if they're more or less permanent things in your home. I think that if it brings your, down your energy, that's kind of a source of visual clutter. So if there's anything that you can find that your eyeballs land on, is there something that you can do to either hide it or remove it? When I declutter with clients in their homes, one of the things that we look for is things that make someone sad or feel weighed down, but they've held on to it. Most of the time, once we identify something like this, the client generally wants to get rid of it, whether by selling or donating. But sometimes it's the minority of the time, but they have to work through the mental and emotional process of letting go of that item. And on my follow-up calls, they're usually happy to tell me, hey, guess what? I got rid of that thing. <laughs> and I think that we can do the same with visual clutter. Anything that you see in your line of sight that weighs down your energy, maybe it's better if you put it away or remove it from your line of sight just to reduce the visual clutter. So next time you get a chance, take a look around your space. Is there any part of your space that you find a little bit frustrating or that brings down your energy. This can be a simple decor detail that you don't like to look at, but keep out and see all the time. We might just get used to seeing something, but remove it from your line of sight or maybe even your home and it'll feel good. Visual clutter can sometimes fly under the radar, but it's like a fly buzzing around your head, so to speak, and it can be a bit of a annoyance or hindrance. So it's worth the effort to reduce visual clutter. I hope that you enjoyed this video and found it informative. If you did, could you please hit the like button as it helps more people to find my channel and I'd really appreciate it. If you'd like to see more videos like this or videos on decluttering and organizing, please subscribe. And thank you so much for watching. See you in the next video.